Welcome back. So we're about to get into a really, really fascinating topic in vector calculus, where we start to think of what kinds of vector fields uh, are irrotational, what kinds of vector fields are potential flows or incompressible. So we've been using uh, div, grad, and curl as building blocks for building up uh, partial differential equations. And we also can think about, you know, if we have a vector field like the fluid flow in the Gulf of Mexico, we can use the divergence uh, and the curl and the gradient to start to analyze properties uh, of those vector fields. And so we know uh, that if we have a scalar field, so given uh, a scalar field, any scalar field, this could be like the temperature distribution, any scalar field, uh, let's call it little f, of x, y, and z, so we're in three dimensions, then uh, this establishes a vector field by taking the gradient. Then um, the gradient of f is a vector field. Okay, and this is a pretty simple idea. So all we have to do is take uh, partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y, and partial f, partial z, and that establishes a vector field everywhere uh, in space. So for every scalar function, we can derive a vector field from that scalar function just by computing the gradient. This could be the temperature distribution uh, and a plate. It could be uh, the concentration of pollen in a forest. It could be kind of any scalar you want. It establishes a vector field, which is the rate of change of that in x, in y, and in z. And so it really begs an interesting question. So the question is, this is a very natural question, is, are all vector fields the gradient of some scalar potential? Are all vector fields, are all vector fields big F, the gradient of some scalar potential, of some uh, scalar potential, some scalar field? Let's call it just some scalar field little f. A very natural question. It's an easy question to pose, and I want you to just think about it for a minute. We know that for every scalar, I can derive a vector field. Is it true that for every vector field, there is an associated scalar uh, that, that we take the gradient of to get f? Now, right off the bat, we should be thinking no. The answer, the answer is probably no. Uh, and one really, really simple way of thinking about this is that if you think of all of the functions f of x, y, and z, like it's a big space of functions, but the space of vector fields f is even bigger because this has three components, a function f1, a function f2, and a function f3. So in some sense, it's like there's three times more variables needed to describe this than uh, these scalar functions. And so for some random uh, vector field that I generate, it probably is not the gradient uh, of a simple scalar potential field. So it's only special, uh, only special uh, vector fields f equal grad little f, okay? Only very special vector fields are the gradient of some potential. And uh, one way we can essentially start to understand which uh, vector fields have this property. So these are called potential flows. Um, these are called, uh, these special fields are called potential flows. Potential uh, flows or uh, conservative fields. So these are essentially conservative vector fields. And you know, if I take an arbitrary function f and I compute its curl, so if if f equals the gradient of some little function, then if I take the curl of my vector field, we know that the curl of a gradient of little f has to equal zero. Then the curl of f, which is again the curl of the gradient of little f, equals zero. So we know that there's tons of vector fields that do not have curl equal to zero. There's lots of f's that do not have curl zero. And so the only vector fields that can be uh, gradients of, of a simple potential have to have curl free. So all of these special vector fields that are gradient flows 
are also curl free. So gradient flows, and I'm just going to keep changing colors because I like it. So gradient flows, uh, you know, grad Fs, are curl free or irrotational, if you like. They are irrotational. There's no rotational component of these potential flows. And so any big F that has any curl at all cannot be the gradient of a scalar potential. So it's kind of a proof that not all vector fields are the gradient of some scalar potential field. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting property. Now, we say that these gradient fields, um, these, this is actually potential flows are slightly more special than this. Potential flows are irrotational and incompressible. So it's not just irrotational, they're also incompressible. So I'm going to amend this and say that these are not called potential flows. These are called uh, gradient flows. Good, so my gradient flows. And potential flows are a subset of gradient flows. So I have a flow, just any vector field F establishes kind of a flow along that vector field. And then um, a subset of that would be these gradient flows. So grad flows are F that is the gradient uh, of some scalar like this. And then potential flows are an even more special case, pot flows, uh, where it's not only irrotational, so this is irrotational, irrotational uh, with no curl. This one is irrotational, not irrational, sometimes I feel irrational, irrotational, but it's also incompressible, um, incompressible. So not only is the curl of F equal to zero, but also we have that the divergence of F is equal to zero for these very special pot flows. So it's kind of like a, a special case. The potential flows are a special case of grad flows are a special case uh, of all flows. And so far I've only talked about gradient flows. We'll talk about potential flows. This is a whole lecture uh, deriving what is the property uh, what kind of flow fields have this property? Very, very important for aerodynamics, electrodynamics, all kinds of interesting uh, flows live, live in, in this potential flow. But let's go back to these gradient fields. So gradient flows um, or gradient fields, notice that I'm using the word field and flow completely interchangeably. My vector field establishes kind of a, it's like a fluid flow. It's like a, a flow of stuff in space. So my gradient field, or flow, whatever you like, uh, big F equals grad little f are conservative by construction. So these are conservative, um, conservative, because no energy is gained or lost going around a closed circle. Um, so no energy gained uh, or lost when we uh, move a particle or a mass or a charge or whatever through uh, a closed orbit. Uh, our conservative, no energy gained or lost, moving our mass or our charge uh, around a closed loop. And so you can think of like a, an amusement park ride, okay? So we have, um, let's say we have, you know, Earth. Earth is pulling in, uh, it's got its gravitational potential. We've already looked at this a little bit. So this uh, is the Earth's gravitational field is the gradient of its potential. So your uh, potential energy is, you know, a function of the radius from Earth. And you can take that scalar function and take its gradient and you actually get the force field of how Earth is pulling you on kind of in these directions pointing towards the center of the Earth. And so if I have, you know, a roller coaster with no friction, so I have some roller coaster with no friction, then when it goes in a closed orbit, no energy was gained or lost uh, through this, this cycle. So if I have a frictionless roller coaster, then it would just go on forever and ever, and no energy would be gained or lost in this uh, potential field. 
So that's a really, really important uh, property of these potential fields is that they are conservative vector fields. They conserve uh, energy, okay? Good. Um, and that's because like the energy <laughs> is this potential function f. In our case, f is the potential energy. So if I make a closed orbit that goes to the same point with the same energy, it is conserving energy. Energy is not gaining uh, or, or leaving the system in that case. Okay, cool. So we've talked a little bit about how now, now what we're thinking about is we have all of these vector fields f. Okay, so we have uh, vector fields f. And these vector fields have properties. They could be, uh, you know, div equals zero, or they could be curl equals zero. If it's just curl zero, it's a gradient flow. If it's div and curl equals zero, zero, it's a potential flow. And it turns out those conditions specify which partial differential equations these f's are solution to. So these vector functions f are solutions to partial differential equations. And again, those PDEs encode physics like conservation of mass, momentum, energy, conservation of angular momentum, uh, co conservative vector fields. So PD our PDEs encode some physics, and the solution of those PDEs are vector fields, F, that have certain properties, like sometimes they're div zero for uh, incompressible fluid flows. Sometimes they're curl zero for conservative uh, potential flows. And so we're gonna look a little bit more, but this is a really, really important idea, is that the solutions of our partial differential equations are offer often vector fields, and the properties of those vector fields are often related to properties of the original conservation law that went into deriving the PDE. Okay, good. Um, so now we know that there are gradient flows that are irrotational. There are potential flows that are both irrotational and incompressible. But in the larger realm of, of just general flows that are neither incompressible nor irrotational, so for a generic flow, let's say, um, you know, for a generic flow, big F, we can always write this function as the sum of two components, one of which is irrotational and the other one of which is divergence free. So we can say that f is equal to minus grad of some uh, potential function. So this is a curl free vector field plus uh, the curl of some other vector field A. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through this. This is in fact called, this is a really uh, important property of vector fields, all vector fields can be decomposed this way. And this is called the Helmholtz decomposition, Helmholtz uh, decomposition. And in higher dimensions, it's also like on manifolds, on, on, on curvy manifolds in higher dimensions, uh, it's called the Hodge uh, decomposition. Just telling you what it's called in case you need to kind of ever look this up. Uh, decomposition. And I'm not going to tell you exactly how to compute this potential and this A for, for any vector field F, but I'm just telling you that this definitely exists. For any generic flow F, you can decompose it into an irrotational component here um, and a, uh, a solenoidal component here. So I'm, I'm going to write this out. This is the potential flow part. Uh, this is conservative, irrotational. So conservative, uh, conservative, and irrotational. And this part is called the solenoidal field. This is the solenoidal, solenoidal part of the field. And this one is rotational, um, but it is incompressible. This is incompressible. Um, and that, of course, relies on the fact that the divergence of the curl of any vector field is zero. So this has to have divergence zero. This has to have curl zero, okay? And so any vector field can be broken up into a irrotational part and an incompressible part. And this part is the conservative uh, part of the vector field, the part that conserves energy. This is the solenoidal part that just kind of rotates things around but it's incompressible. 
And this is a really, really useful decomposition in a lot of physics. This comes up a lot in electromagnetism. It comes up a lot in the fluid flow equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, kind of all throughout physics. Um, also, when we do calculus on manifolds, uh, this Hodge decomposition comes up a lot. So really cool idea, these vector fields F, which we often think of as the solution of a partial differential equation, have properties. Sometimes they're entirely uh, irrotational or entirely solenoidal. Remember, um, an incompressible fluid flow has to have this incompressible, like it has to have this, this divergence free condition. So they have to be solenoidal vector fields. That's really interesting. So if my partial differential equation is the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, then I have to get out solenoidal vector fields F out of that. That's pretty cool, okay? And so there's lots of things like that that you can use to help you find these solutions and derive these PDEs. And you know, this is a big, big field, uh, hundreds of years in the making. We're still figuring it out uh, for nonlinear PDEs. So stay tuned for more. In the next lecture, we're going to focus entirely on this class of potential flows which are really, really important, uh, important in physics. These essentially give you, these are the solution of Laplace's equation. And a lot of harmonic analysis and complex variables uh, is really focused on finding the solutions of Laplace's equation, which are these potential flows. So that's all coming up soon. Uh, thank you.